The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. My name is Katharina von Münster. So the program is called ACTCHAM, Reconciliation Service for Peace. It's a German nonprofit. It was founded after the Second World War by Germans, by Protestants, who said that we as Germans, we as Christians, haven't done anything to prevent the Holocaust, haven't done anything you know, to prevent the Nazis of coming to power. So the least what we can do today after the Holocaust, after the Second World War, is to try to reach out to those people that had suffered under the Nazis. So the idea was to establish a program that would send out young Germans to do a year, or even more than that, a year of service, uh, with Holocaust survivors, with other people that were persecuted um, by the Nazis, and do it in the countries where these people lived. Uh, so we have a program in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, and the United States, and in Israel. So in 13 countries altogether, including Germany nowadays. And we send out about 180 volunteers every year to these 13 countries. And they do a year of service um, at Holocaust education centers um, with the Jewish community um, here in New York, for instance, with the Holocaust survivors and with a number of social service agencies. And they also work in social service projects that are, are oriented towards um, helping people that today face discrimination. So it's like two, um, two things that we try to do. First of all, educate our young people about the past and have them take action to remember the past and also to, to reach out to survivors of the Holocaust. And at the same time, also trying to, you know, if you can, apply lessons from the past and try to build a more inclusive society. So these are the kind of two major um, areas where we work in. So I think when we talk about the Nazi time and about the Nazi period, it's really uh, important um, for us not to just talk in general about the Nazis came to power and then they overtook Germany and then they were the country and they caused the Holocaust. I mean, so many Germans were involved. Maybe they were not active, like in the SS or Wehrmacht, but they were bystanders. They, they knew about what was going on. They saw the people being transported, being put on the train and transported um, to the camps. I know, like from, from my personal history, my grandmother, when we tried to talk to her about that, about the past, she always started to cry. So I think there was a consciousness, a feeling of guilt that also for her that she hadn't done en enough. We, we know and she told us that she had a, a Jewish friend, a Jewish girlfriend at high school um, who one day disappeared. And, and she didn't know what happened to her, she told us, but she also didn't try to find out. So I think that was one of the things that, that caused her a feeling of guilt because she did, hadn't tried even, you know, to find out what happened to her girlfriend or to even tried um, to help her. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's very important to say that, you know, Germany at the time did that. Nazi, yes, it was Nazi Germany, but, you know, what, there were a lot of, there were perpetrators, but also a lot of bystanders who made this whole thing possible. With me personally, I mean, there's, there's another thing to that. I, as I mentioned, I grew up in, in East Berlin. I was born in East Berlin in a country that uh, didn't take any responsibility for its Nazi past, a country that didn't teach us much, a little bit about the Holocaust, but like the six million Jews that were murdered by Germans. We didn't learn about that at school. Maybe there was a footnote in a book, but I don't remember that. I was uh, growing up in East Berlin in a neighborhood that had a big Jewish population before the Holocaust. And there was a Jewish cemetery even just a few blocks away. But we didn't know about the Jewish cemetery. We didn't know what it was. We couldn't enter in. So they didn't teach us anything um, about that. And Israel and the United States were the biggest enemy of that country. Now, obviously, that all changed. And I'm really grateful that you know this change came about. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here um, today. Um, but I think as an East German, and especially also looking at what's going on in Germany today, and especially in, in East Germany where you have 
you know, some groups of right-wing extremists that are very active and very violent, I feel a special kind of responsibility that we really have to continue to remember the past, but also try to you know, make, make sure that things like this won't happen, that groups like these anti-Semitic and neo-Nazi groups, that, you know, they won't come to power again. So that's kind of the personal responsibility that I feel because of my personal biography and the way I grew up. So the program, I mean, we wanted from the beginning, actually, we wanted to start working. That was the, when the founders uh, um, founded this organization, they wanted to work in Russia and Poland and in Israel because they are the population, the people that suffered under the Nazis live. But because of the Cold War, activities like in Eastern Europe, Russia and Poland were very limited. I mean, our organization was also active in East Germany, but East German government didn't like what they were doing and didn't like to be reminded of the past. Um, so really starting a, like, like the fully fledged program that we have today in Eastern Europe, which is taking place in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Russia, in Poland, Czech Republic, was only possible after the fall of the wall, after the Iron Curtain um, came down. And um, we have a group of, I, mean, I think, 20 or so people in Poland, which is actually an interesting program because it also involves Polish and Ukrainian volunteers coming together to work at uh, memorial sites like the former concentration uh, camp of Auschwitz in other places. So this program really developed and evolved into a multilateral program where we not only send out Germans to these countries, um, but also we engage people living in, that, in these countries in this kind of work of remembrance and trying to find out what can we learn from it and how we can we go forwards and also remember it and but also take action to create a better future. We learn a lot about Holocaust and the Second World War. It starts in the sixth grade. Um, and then we learn again about it on the 8th grade, more intense, and then on the 11th grade. And uh, um, before we came to America to start our volunteering year, we had some orientation days in Berlin for a week. And there we discussed a lot about Holocaust, elders. I feel a big responsibility because um, my family is um, um, part Holocaust survivors, so my grand aunt is a Holocaust survivor, and on my other side of my family, um, we could be a part of the Nazi regime, but that is not really true, uh, really clear. I think that to understand the future, you have to know about the history. So that's a big thing why I think this is seriously and um, yeah, important for us. Well, there is some resistance here and there, and especially Russia, obviously the situation is right now is very difficult. But I think from the beginning what was important was that we had partners on the ground. I mean, also for countries like Israel in the beginning, we started working there in 61. That was the year when the Eichmann trial took place. So that was a very sensitive year for many Israelis, especially for the Holocaust survivors and also the second and third generation. So it was very difficult for them to accept then to have a group of Germans coming over, speaking German and reminding them of all the trauma they went to. But we had partners, partners like um, Teddy Kollek, the former mayor of Jerusalem, and other people that were survivors themselves who said, yes, we want to accept your sign of atonement that you're trying uh, to set, and we want to help you. So I think this is the crucial thing in our work, that we have partners in all these places, and that can make the work possible. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So obviously we're working with a very specific group because they apply for our program. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of options what you can do. Most of them do it as a gap year, right, between high school and college. And there are hundreds of options what they could do. They could go to South America or to, to some country in Africa. But they choose to come with our program. And they know that you know, part of our program and actually also part of the preparation is trying um, to find out what your families, where your families lived during the Nazi period and if your great grandparents or grandparents now almost the fourth generation how they were involved as perpetrators bystanders or if they came from some other countries like Turkey we have a, you know we have a big population that migrated from Turkey in the recent years so we're also trying to you know uh, encourage them to, to find out how these countries acted during um, the second world war and really it boils down to um, you know putting them in a place where they you know try to figure out so how would I have acted you know, if I had been in that position. So this is the kind 
um, of idea that we, um, that we are trying um, that to encourage them to really deal with the individual, like the, the actions of an individual, not just make it a general history and talk about the facts and figures, but really um, bring it on a more personal level and encourage them to think about, so how would I have acted uh, in this situation? So the, 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 the volunteers, the young Germans that apply with us, they are interested already in this uh, kind of topic and in this, in this history and they want to find out more and then usually what happens also during a year like during a service like Martinas and David that they're doing here in New York they're very often asked also so what about your great grandparents your grandparents and they're actually you know forced or encouraged really to deal with this history and also to, to reflect on so what can I do differently today to really make it not happen anymore and also help creating a world that is just different and more inclusive and, and just more sensitive to discrimination and hate and anti-Semitism and xenophobia. I mean it was in the past and there were some people who were really into Nazi regime uh, who were for it but there were some people who were against it and that did something against it and uh, now the most Germans are really uh, I would say completely different than uh, back in the days. Um. My first um and a well, real encounter, I think, was when I came to Israel and served there as a volunteer on a kibbutz. Because there are so there were so many moments that you are confronted with German Germany's past, Nazi past. So I had it happen in the supermarket. I was standing in line at the cashier, and the woman heard me talking German. She was kind of backing off, and then you know she, you could see that she, she felt just by, by hearing my, that I speak German and finding out that I'm German that. Um, she just didn't want to have any kind of interaction with me. The first thing I get ever asked as at every client is what did your parents have done or what did your family have done in the war? And that's like the hello when I meet them at first. So it's quite a strange question because uh, it's they don't want to talk to you before they got clear about your history and your personal background. I mean, it's uh, amazing and it's uh, really hard to uh, to understand it and uh, to feel like they felt and uh, nearly impossible to feel like they felt and to understand uh, exactly what they experienced. It's not always easy for the Holocaust survivors but also not for our generation now because we have to understand what our family back in the days have done. So every, each and every person has to deal with this uh, kind of history in their own family. And the Holocaust survivors are yeah, telling us their stories and we should hear to that. More often it happened, and what that I was really so grateful for is that you had um, these encounters of the Holocaust survivors that were of German origin and that wanted to insist in talking German to you because it's still their mother tongue and they still feel a lot of affinity to, to the German culture. And they just encouraged me, myself, and I also saw it in many meetings we organized with the volunteers, really to take responsibility. They always told us in the beginning and told me, you are not guilty. We know that you're third, fourth generation, but we really want you to take responsibility. And this is such an empowering message um, that the survivors give us, give me, give our volunteers, that you know, we, we take their stories with us when, when they are gone. We will share them. We are sharing them with our families, with our friends and partner organizations in Germany. And we will do everything to continue to remember this past, but um, also help in creating a society that is more tolerant. Uh, Dr. Eva Fogelman. I am a uh, social psychologist and psychotherapist in private practice. I'm also a author of Conscious and Courage, Rescuers of Jews During the Holocaust, and writer and co-producer of Breaking the Silence, The Generation After the Holocaust. And also I've dealt with, uh, with Germans as well. I've written about children of Nazis. There has been a major shift towards uh, the generations after the Holocaust and their relationship to the Holocaust in Germany. So for example, when Action and Reconciliation began in 1958, the, the generation that was born after the Holocaust knew very little about their parents' experience and they were very eager to 
uh, to learn things, but there was tremendous silence from the parent generation. And um, so you had uh, those who volunteered wanted to meet Holocaust survivors to learn what had happened to the survivors and perhaps through that understand what their parents might have done or might not have done. Today we see a totally different young population. 81% of young Germans between the ages of 18 and 25 are Holocausted out. There is Holocaust fatigue in Germany now. Uh, they feel they are, this generation does not feel a sense of responsibility or guilt for what had happened. Yeah, I would say that there is, there is tremendous uh, Holocaust fatigue, I would say, uh, throughout uh, throughout Europe, but I would say particularly in Germany because Germany has is the country that has taken more responsibility for the persecution of the Jews, for the genocide of the Jews, uh, than any other country. I mean, there are still countries that are uh, that haven't fully taken responsibility. If you think about France, for example, uh, everybody you speak to in France, their grandfather was in the resistance. Um, and uh, Austria also is a country that hasn't, you know, they see themselves as the first victims of uh, national socialism. And uh, so it is quite different in Germany that, you know, has taken responsibility as a country. Uh, Germany has been giving reparations and restitutions to Holocaust survivors till, uh, since the uh, early 1950s. There has been a lot of reconciliation work that has been done between the German government and the, uh, and the Israeli government so that you can see that the younger, uh, the younger generation, uh, we are now talking about third, fourth, and even fifth generation after the Holocaust. Today is, uh, this year, is 76 years after Kristallnacht. And um, so that we're, you know, we're talking almost four generations after, um, after the Holocaust. And I think it's important for people to understand that any generation uh, in Germany uh, or of any generation of persecutors that were born after the Holocaust, they are not responsible for the mass murder of, uh, of the Jews and the other victims of, uh, of Nazism. So that what the generations after the Holocaust, whether, and, and that goes for all the generations after the Holocaust, is what kind of responsibility do we personally take on as a moral responsibility ability, uh, not because we did something, but rather because we do not want a repetition of a, um, of a genocide. We do not want to create societies that have us and them people in it. And that's what's important for, for the generations going post, uh, post the Holocaust. I think that's probably how they, how generations after the Holocaust would, who are in denial of what the Austrians did, would be saying is that they didn't really understand the extent of, uh, of what, was, what was to come. Because don't forget that the, the final solution of the, of the Jewish problem did not be begin in uh, March of 1938 when, uh, when Germany invaded Austria, so that nobody had this sense of what was going to happen. There's also another element here, if you take a look at a country like Holland, for example, that also had a tremendous amount of um, embracing of, of Hitler because they felt that uh, all the economic ills of, of that society are going to be solved when Germany takes over of Holland and they will be in a much better financial uh, situation of, after having suffered the, uh, the depression that took place in, in, the late 20, in the late 20s, early 30s. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, any group of people who get together who are different one from the other, whether it's a different religion, whether it's a different nationality, whether it's a different culture, I think this is one of the most important things that, that young people today can do, is to meet 
people who are different from them so that we can ultimately get to the point where we see a shared humanity. And so obviously I'm, I'm very proud of, of people who, uh, particularly young people, uh, who want to spend their time volunteering to meet people who are different from, from them. What are the effects of the Holocaust on the second generation of, of Holocaust survivors? And uh, that's a complicated um, issue in that there have been many stereotypes about the, the intergenerational transmission of trauma. The way that I understand it is that there is a second generation complex, and that is that all children of Holocaust survivors go through a particular mourning process uh, of people that they never knew who were killed during the Holocaust. And so all mourning processes begin with a sense of shock that this happened. So you have children of survivors who might have eavesdropped and heard conversations about, oh, so-and-so died and so-and-so died, or they saw pictures. There were a lot of pictures in the early years of the mass, uh, the mass killings, the mass graves that were, uh, that were around. Some of them were newsreels uh, when, you went to, uh, when you went to the movies. And then people go into a stage of denial where you don't think about it, you don't want to know about it, you don't ask. And at a certain point, there's a confrontation where all of a sudden you want to know what happened and that's when children of Holocaust survivors begin to ask a lot of questions of their own parents, of relatives, uh, going to visit the death camps, going to visit their parents' hometowns. And it is through that confrontation that a lot of feelings get evoked, and that a lot of rage, a lot of sense of helplessness. I wish I could undo what my parents had gone through. Survivor guilt, feeling, you know, why, why am I here? Uh, I should have been the one who was suffering, not my parents or not my, my relatives. Uh, depression, grief. And some children of survivors in that stage of feelings may over-identify with the parents' pain and suffering. They may feel, I don't have a right to um, be happy in my life or enjoy myself because so many people have died. Sometimes children of Holocaust survivors in that particular stage of feeling put themselves into situations where they too may have to survive a dangerous situation. So for example, during the Vietnam War, children of survivors who went to demonstrations and had gas thrown at them by the police would come home and say, I know what it must have felt like, I just had gas thrown at me. Uh, or putting themselves into situations where they're victims and always seeing a victim oppressor. Uh, with that stage of people remain in that stage for too long, uh, that at times causes some psychological difficulty. So the important thing for children of survivors is to get to that final stage, which is a search for meaning. How do you channel some of these feelings into something constructive and positive? And in fact, what you see amongst children of survivors, you see children of survivors helping their parents tell their stories by doing oral histories, writing their parents' memories, was there have been many films that have been done, uh, children of survivors who've taken their parents back and, and made uh, documentaries of that, children of survivors who were speaking out against other genocides today, uh, children of survivors who are volunteering or teaching, raising consciousness, not only about the persecution of the Jews, but persecution of other, um, of other groups. Uh, so for example, what is happening in Rwanda? what has happened in the, uh, in the Sudan, not being passive bystanders, but rather speaking up. And there are other children of survivors who take all those feelings and feel, uh, I'm not going to give Hitler a post-human victory. I am going to have a lot of children. I'm going to immerse myself in the Jewish culture that was lost, uh, whether it's Yiddish, whether it's learning the Talmud, uh, so that I will have something to transmit to the next uh, to the next generation, and so feeling a part in a sense of a of a community. 
So that is the, uh, the this mourning process is part of the complex that children of survivors go through knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, the other way in which the Holocaust affects children of survivors has to do with their own identity. Are children of survivors proud of being Jewish? Uh, or do they feel that they have to hide their Jewishness because who knows, there may be the next Holocaust coming and they don't want anybody to know, in fact, that they are, uh, that they are Jewish. Uh, how much do they identify or not identify with being a child of, of Holocaust uh, survivors? Do they feel alienated from the rest of the society because their parents were persecuted as, um, as Jews. And the other uh, third important issue is communication in the family. Was this a family where the parents spoke too early or too soon about all that, that they had experienced during the Holocaust? Or were they totally silent? In most families, parents spoke about their experiences in bits and pieces. Uh, but you obviously had children of survivors who hurt too soon. Uh, when that happened, children of survivors would be would get very angry and uh, had a personality where they were constantly angry, constantly looking for that next uh, for that next uh, persecutor. But on the whole, I think what we see is that we see that uh, children of survivors have been able to. Uh, over the years, uh, not be ashamed of their parents, but rather are proud of them. And I would say that part of the shame that children of Holocaust survivors felt in the early years, I'm talking about the 50s, the 60s, is because society, whether it was American society, Israeli society, shunned Holocaust survivors. And uh, there were things that were written in the um, Saturday Evening Post that was a popular magazine in those days that the best people, you know, died. And anybody who survived must have done something devious in order to survive. Holocaust survivors had to form their own, sometimes their own community centers, their own synagogues, because they weren't really welcomed into the already organized American Jewish community. So along with that, uh, and Holocaust survivors felt that nobody cared about uh, what had happened to them. So people would say, oh, I was, you know, if they would start telling their story, people would say, oh, I know what you mean. You were, you know, we were, we were hungry too. We had uh, food ration cards. We can only get chicken. We couldn't get any meat. So Holocaust survivors, when they heard that people really wouldn't understand what hunger meant, stopped talking about their experiences. And with that, there was also, so children of survivors, like, how the survivors felt a tremendous sense of shame. But in this generation that we're in today, I would say that there's been a transformation and there is a tremendous sense of pride that the, the society in general and therefore children of survivors feel very proud that their parents indeed were able to not only survive, uh, the uh, genocide that they did, but also what they have been able to do with their lives, both in terms of creating families and creating communities and, uh, and contributing to society in general. That's great. Uh, yes, I was the narrator, subject, and edited a film called German Shepherd, a 10 minute animated short film that was directed by a close Swedish friend of mine, Niels Bergendahl. Well, it started as a off the cuff interview that my friend did, just asking me why I had this obsession with German Jewish history. And basically, it was a 45 minute interview about my mother who hated Germans. She, she went through the war, lost all of her relatives pretty much. And um, I was raised that way, as Germans as the boogeyman. And um, when I was a little older, my late teenage, early 20s, I thought I have to meet some nice Germans. I mean, I was to sort of counteract how I was raised and the, you know, the generalizations that I, I got from my mother. And I did a trip to Germany, which I called to myself, I'm going to meet a nice German in Germany trip. And actually, I connected with this group, Action Reconciliation Service for Peace, um, which is some 
uh, young Germans that, as a part of reconciliation, work with Jewish organizations. And um, I found that there was a lot of sensitivity towards the issues that were most important to me. And um, th so the last part of the movie is how I came to reconcile with German history, but also still had a few issues left over, just about you know, the moral choices people make in immoral times, judging those who make those choices when you don't have to make those choices. And we found animation was a very effective way to put the message across. So I ended up in Berlin, and I've been going back there pretty much ever since over the last 20 years. I guess I go once or twice a year. And over the years, I developed a lot of friends. In fact, I think I have more friends in Berlin than I do at my home in New York. Once I started learning about the Holocaust, when my mother would speak more about her relatives and you know her, well, her feelings about Germans and Germany and history and nature of people, um, once I became more aware of that when I was I guess in my early teens, I developed a real kind of obsession with the idea of knowing what the victim felt. And I used to like, sleep on the floor and I used to like carry groceries till they were like cutting into my fingers so I couldn't bear it just trying to think, oh, this is nothing compared to what they felt. So it became this idea of wanting to identify with what all my relatives went through. And, um, and I ended up studying history and I had always, I had a very hard time with that part of history. I could not digest it. I always thought of history as something you learn, you digest, you move on. But that period, I just I could not digest. I always kind of jumped over it and went back to it. And it was this thing that and I woke up thinking about, went to bed thinking about. Um, I just felt this need I had to make some sense out of it. And, and it was, wasn't too easy. You know, part of it was meeting a lot of young Germans who were sensitive to this issue. Um, I ended up being like the, the Jewish person they can talk to and they, you know, as always, my friends make a joke about the grandfather question because every German friend I have goes through that process of discussing their grandparents or, what, you know, the Nazi part of their family. Um, then we can get to normalization. And the combination of growing up with Holocaust survivors and having honest discussions with young Germans who are sensitive and open to discussing it, it did give me some peace. I mean, it's something I still have a bit of an obsession with and a lot of issues with, but as something I say in the film, instead of it sort of enveloping me and being a part of me all the time, it's kind of like a subject that I can place outside of me, and I just visit it sometimes. So that, that's how I worked it out, something I could handle. Something about the city that constantly draws me back there. It's funny because Germans have an extra layer of work they have to go through to get to be my friend. And it's all around this, you know, like the grandfather question. What did your grandfather do during the war? And if I don't know, I can't even be friendly with them. I, mean, I don't mind if they were an SS executioner, if they're willing to talk about it, but I just, it's a strange thing. I cannot get to normalcy before I discuss the Nazi thing. Um, is there a sense of forgiveness inside of me? For the young generation, yes. I mean, I think their responsibility is to know the past, be aware of it, and as kind of commemorate those who were lost and to make sure nothing like that happens again. Um, for the generation that lived during that time, I don't have forgiveness. I mean, in fact, when I used to go to Germany, every white-haired person I saw was suspect, and I would always think, you know, what did you do to the Jews? Because there was this sense after the war of rehabilitation and changing the past. Every German family seemed to hide two Jews. Um, but I remember the first time I went to Germany, there was this sweet old lady sitting in front of me knitting. And I just couldn't stop thinking, like, you know, how many Jews did you turn in? So that's some, the generation that lived at that time had a very hard time with. And, and my mother actually had a hard time with me going over there and having anything to do with 
anyone who was alive during that time, or was at least a young adult or older. She passed away during the making of German Shepherd. She was 89. In the beginning, I mean, the first time I went to Europe, I studied in, in Tel Aviv for one year. I got a, a travel stipend, and I went to Europe. And at that time, I was still thinking, you know, I should not step foot inside of Germany. I was still in my mother's head. And I mean, it's a little crazy now thinking about it, but I took trains around the whole country, probably added 20 hours to my travels just so I didn't have to travel through Germany. And, and it, it was after that that I started interacting with young Germans. I, I didn't tell her about my travels there in the beginning. Um, and when I did, she thought it was a waste of time and that they'll never change and they're just born to hate you. And um, But it's interesting, she did come around one time I have a friend there, Will Schmiza, who's a he's a well-known um, journalist over there, and the only elderly Germans I was ever friendly with <laughs> were his uh, aunt and uncle. Gisela uh, was his aunt, who was a sculptor, and she always had a very hard time with the idea that my mother wanted to have nothing to do with her generation at all, and she made her a sculpture by this artist named Ernst Barlock, who was, you know, someone who was not favored by the Nazis. It was a, a nice little reproduction of something called a shepherd in the storm, a shepherd shielding a dog. And I told her my mother was would not have any interest in it. But actually I gave it to my mother and she was very moved by it. It was the first time she had anything positive to say about anything German. And she actually wrote her a letter, um, which I saved a copy of, just saying, you know, maybe now it's time to reach across the waters and begin a discussion, you know, she's a survivor of tears and it's not enough to her to forgive, but her gesture, her gesture made her really f soften a little bit. So that, I mean, I think for the German woman, it was a highlight of her entire older life. And for my mother, from that time on, I mean, she didn't want to have anything to do with Germany, but she was a little more supportive of what I call my projects over there. My, my mother was from what is now Ukraine, but was Poland at the time, called Lvov, today called Lviv, it's on the border. And she felt worse about the Ukrainians and the Poles than she even did about the Germans. She grew up there and she said there were constant anti-Semitic parades. There were constant, you know, there were um, in the universities, they would take nails and like, disfigure Jewish girls. And pretty much every non-Jewish interaction she had there had some tinge of anti-Semitism, and she blamed that a lot on you know the church and the teachings of you know the Jews are our Christ killers and enemy. But um, she told me that uh, her experience with the Ukrainians and the Poles were very negative when it came to anti-Semitism. So I mean the Germans she's thought of as the mastermind who made it all happen, but for the Poles and Ukrainians she th she thought of them as just the perpetrators and extremely eager to carry out. The, the killing once it was made available as a possibility. I mean, I've been a liaison and mentor for Action Reconciliation Service for Peace since the early 90s, and I try to connect with some of the young Germans. Um, and I think it's an amazing program because they really make them sensitive, not just to Holocaust history, but to issues about fair treatment of Israel in, in the press, um, Jews today in the world, um, historical connection of, uh, of Jews, for example, in Poland. Uh, you know, most Germans, I think, don't learn much about the Polish history, the thousand-year history that was lost. Um, and having them here gives me an opportunity to try to, I try to educate them a little bit more also in all these areas so they go back to Germany and sort of as ambassadors <laughs> from the states of having a real knowledge of Jewish history, Holocaust history, Israel and, you know, what Jews are like today. It makes me feel very fulfilled. And when I talk about my coming to terms with German history, you know, through talking to a lot of Holocaust survivors and my German friends, this, I mean, this process of ARSP, uh, Action Reconciliation, is a big part of it because it's the third generation where, you know, a lot of Holocaust survivors are dying and there's this idea that it's just going to become a very historical issue that the third and eventually fourth generation won't be able to connect with. And I feel like having an interaction with these young volunteers um, 
besides being fulfilling, having the back and forth discussion on these topics, um, it helps pave the way for next generations to keep the memory alive of, you know, Jewish history that survived and Jewish history that was lost from before the Holocaust. Holocaust denial, that's, uh, that's a very disturbing issue. And it's interesting, something just came up this week, a volunteer that was here last year that I was friendly with, Linus Jansen, had an article published in Fox News, very positive about working with Holocaust survivors. And somehow this Holocaust denier website got hold of it and you know, was, and put in a lot of anti-Semitic <laughs> language about, oh, this German is, is fool, doesn't realize, you know, this is all a hoax. And, and, and it's sort of brought up the issue in action reconciliation because they're trying to get it removed. And then there's the issue of free speech. You know, in Germany, Holocaust denial is illegal. And in some other European countries, in the United States, it's not. I mean, as long as it's not, you know, inciting violence, you pretty much can put up a website about Holocaust denial, about Jewish control of the media, about a lot of anti-Semitic uh, ideas. So, I mean, there are there are several people out there who are working against it, but it's it's something something you have to really pay attention to because again once the Holocaust survivors are gone you know, in the next 10, 15, 20 years it's going to become very easy to put out all of these Holocaust hoax, Holocaust denying. Um, there's magazines, books, I mean and scholars that swear by it. Um, so it's, it's disturbing and definitely something that has to be monitored carefully. It, makes, it really makes me sad. It makes me <laughs> angry. Uh, it's, you know, I spend so much of my life learning the details of individual survivors and learning the histories and trying to come to terms with how it happened and why it happened. And it just really actually fills me with rage, uh, thinking that there are people out there who can just nonchalantly and cavalierly, as a, you know, just as a shield for just being an anti-Semite, to put out this pseudo-history and pseudo-articles based on nothing, just well, what you know, they refer a lot of these hoax people refer to Hitler's big lie, which is what they're perpetuating themselves. If they say something enough, people will believe it. Uh, so it's it's a, it, it's a mix of really sadness and rage, because it should be a non-issue for everybody. I mean, no matter how educated and educated they are, of the you know significance and the tragedy of you know the Holocaust. It's a, you know historical genocide that. There's no room for denial. Um, you know, it's a film with a message. I mean, it was just a buddy film that we made. We did not expect it to do so well. It's been in about 50 film festivals. I mean, Niels, the director, has a day job. He's a photographer. I'm a judge during the day downtown. Um, so it's really just a, our first project together. And it was, I think, because it was a project that was spontaneous, earnest, and personal between two friends that it it really resonated as uh, a truthful and meaningful message.